Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so this is the Brown Institute for Media Innovation Speaker Series. Uh, I am the director of the Brown Institute here at Stanford. My name is Manisha Agarwala. And uh, I wanted to start by just asking something that I often ask at these events. How many of you know what the Brown Institute is? Okay. Uh, I would say maybe two-thirds of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Brown Institute was uh, endowed in 2012 with a gift from Helen Gurley Brown, the longtime editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine. Uh, it is an institute that is located here at Stanford in the School of Engineering, and it is also located in the School of Journalism at Columbia University. Helen Gurley Brown endowed the Institute in the name of her husband, David Brown, uh, who had been an undergraduate at Stanford and then went on to journalism school at the Columbia School of Journalism, so hence the two locations. And uh, he was well known as a film producer in his own right. He produced films like Jaws and Driving Miss Daisy. Um, and the mission of the Institute is to really support media innovation, both in uh, telling new kinds of stories and developing technologies to tell those stories through different kinds of media, and new media in particular. Um, and uh, a lot of the work that we do is uh, related to journalism and storytelling. Um, and so uh, we have this speaker series that is designed to have luminaries from uh, technology and journalism and media come in and tell us about their work. Um, and so uh, today we have Nick Diakopoulos, and I'll tell you more about him in a second, but uh, just before I start that, I want to mention that um, we will be having another speaker, Kara Swisher, the, the technology journalist. Uh, she will be here on May 2nd. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you're interested in seeing her, that'll, that'll be more of a Q&A session with me, and uh, if you're interested in hearing her speak, uh, please stay tuned for that. Um, okay, back to Nick. <laughs> so uh, Nick uh, is an old friend, and uh, he is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Communication at Northwestern University. Um, and uh, what he studies is the connection between technology and journalism. Uh, he is one of the uh, people that really founded the area of computational journalism. Um, and he did this while he was a graduate student at, uh, at Georgia Tech. Uh, and so uh, I had the pleasure of first meeting uh, Nick back when he uh, established the first computational journalism symposiums in 2008. Eight. Yeah. Wow, so it's been over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So Nick is currently at Northwestern, um, and uh, he is also a Tau Fellow at Columbia University uh, in the School of Journalism there. Um, and he's also an Associate Professor too yep. at uh, the <laughs> University of Bergen Department of Information Science and Media Studies. Uh, and as I mentioned, his work today really focuses on computational and data journalism uh, and emphasizes algorithmic accountability and social computing in the news. Um, he received his PhD at Georgia Tech, as I said, um, and uh, he has a bachelor's degree from Brown. Um, and today, he's going to tell us about his new book. Uh, is it out? Uh, it'll be out in a, in a few weeks, yeah. Okay, so it's almost out, and uh, it's all about how algorithms are rewriting the news. So with that, let's welcome Nick. All right, thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Manish. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with you at, at Stanford today um, to share a little bit of my work and my thinking uh, related to um, with a new book I have coming out. Um, it'll actually be out June 10th, so um, uh, just, a, just a few weeks away. Uh, the title of the book is Automating the News, How Algorithms Are Re Rewriting the Media. Um, but really, it's um, everything uh, about computational journalism that I've been uh, working on and researching uh, for the past, um, I guess, 11 years uh, since we, we started um, uh, thinking about that back at Georgia Tech. 
Um, so again, my, my background is, uh, is in computer science, but I've been working uh, sort of at the intersection of computer science and journalism for the last um, 11 years now. Um, and I now um, also run a lab at Northwestern, the Computational Journalism Lab, uh, where we study, design, and build um, tools and technologies uh, related to um, uh, algorithms in the news. So there's the book if you want to check it out. Uh, just, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of an overview um, now, and then I'll drill into um, some of the specific uh, ideas that I get into in the book. Um, the book sort of, you know, paints a, a broad overview of the field of computational journalism, looking at everything from editorial data mining, you know, how algorithms are used to find and discover new news stories, um, to automated content production, how algorithms and automation can be used to produce or, or write. Uh, news articles in some cases, um, social bots, so the, the use of um, AI agents to um, disseminate and interact with people on social media platforms, um, algorithms in, in news distribution, so talking about the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, but also increasingly news websites that are using algorithms to uh, make their sites more sticky or indeed even to curate um, their home pages. Uh, and then finally, um, getting into issues of algorithmic accountability reporting. So how do journalists or how can journalists uh, investigate um, algorithms in society uh, and start scrutinizing the ways in which um, those algorithms uh, sort of um, influence or exert uh, power uh, over people um, in society. Okay, so let's get this out of the way. Um, AI is kind of at the pinnacle of hype, I think, or wait, oh, Oh, now it's at the pinnacle of hype. Um, certainly, full automation of news production is, is pretty tantalizing. Um, and there are some genuinely impressive things uh, and, and helpful applications of AI um, that we should celebrate. It can en it enhance investigative journalism. Um, it can create new interactive news experiences through news bots. Uh, it can optimize content distribution um, on platforms. Uh, and it can generally enhance the scale and the speed, uh, the efficiency, the breadth, and uh, the, the personalization of content. Um, some might say it's magical, um, and it may not surprise anyone in this room, uh, but let me assure you that uh, the magical AI fairy is not real. Behind the curtain, we need to understand, I think, the designers, the editors, the reporters, the data scientists, the engineers, who are contributing to uh, the appearance of uh, intelligence. Uh, and lar that's largely what the book focuses on and what I want to focus on today um, are the, the people and the human issues that surface when we use AI for news production and journalism. Uh, in particular, I want to cover um, two main themes that I sort of discuss in the book. Um, the first is about human values and technology, uh, and the second is about hybridization of um, of people and um, algorithms uh, in uh, news work. So in terms of human values, I mean, all technologies, including especially uh, AI technologies, embed and encode human values. They reflect choices like what data was used to train the system, um, how that data was defined and sampled, uh, how algorithms were parameterized or the defaults chosen, uh, what inputs uh, the system pays attention to, or uh, indeed, you know, if uh, something was quantified uh, to begin with. Um, I think the important thing to, to realize is, you know, AI systems are, are tools. They're built by people uh, to serve um, human means and ends. Uh, and so that makes them uh, political uh, um, um, tools as well. They exude the values of their designers and developers uh, in the ways that, that those values have been built into them. I think this suggests a really interesting opportunity for news organizations, for journalists, to become more aware of and, and to start exercising their, uh, their professional um, and organizational and institutional values uh, in terms of um, you know, building those, uh, those values into technologies that then go on to drive algorithmic news production. Um, if it's not going to be journalistic values that get built into these technologies, um, alternative values, uh, maybe from non-editorial stakeholders or maybe from uh, platform companies will be, the media, will be the values that get built into these technologies uh, and will fill that void. 
Um, so I think journalists need to start treating AI as a new medium, in fact, uh, in which um, journalists can express and exercise their ethical and normative values through the code that they implement. The second theme I want to talk about is hybridization. So um, certainly, I think every wave of new technology, you know, whether it's telephony uh, or photography, the copy machine, uh, uh, digitization has somehow changed the nature of work uh, in journalism, you know, the, the nature of roles and tasks and workflows and so on. AI is no different in that regard. Uh, it's also a technology um, that I think is already and will continue to change the way that um, news work is done. It will often complement but rarely substitute entirely for um, uh, an entire journalist. Um, some economists have estimated that um, about only about 15% of a reporter's time and maybe only 9% of an editor's uh, time uh, can be substituted by current levels of, um, of AI technology. Uh, humans still have an edge over non-Hollywood AI uh, in at least two key areas that are essential to journalism, uh, complex communication uh, and expert thinking. Reporting, listening, responding and pushing back, uh, negotiating with sources, and then having the creativity to compellingly put that together or knowing when you need to change tack to try a different angle. Um, these are all essential, indispensable journalistic tasks. Um, uh, none of which can be done by AI. AI can, of course, uh, often augment human work uh, and make it more efficient or indeed uh, higher quality. More often than not, though, AI technologies actually create new types of work. Um, things like configuring the system, parameterizing it, managing knowledge uh, bases, um, producing data, writing templates. Um, these are all you know, uh, tasks involved with setting up and operating these systems. So far from destroying jobs in journalism, um, my research has found that AI seems to be creating uh, jobs and at least tasks and new forms of work for journalists. So I'm going to uh, offer some examples that I, that I hope will give you um, uh, a sense for, for, for um, how these sort of themes play out uh, uh, and illustrate these themes. So the first area of examples I want to get into relates to this, uh, this uh, topic of editorial data mining and machine learning. Um, I'm not going to show this video now, uh, but um, you're wel welcome to check it out later. You can see the, um, the link there at the bottom. Um, I'll just describe the, the project briefly. Uh, this is a project that was uh, published by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, a couple of years ago now. Uh, it was an investigation into um, uh, doctors uh, and sex abuse. That's the name of the, 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 uh, the project. And really it was an attempt to look um, at a national scale and uh, try to find instances uh, in which uh, doctors had been um, sanctioned for sexual um, uh, misconduct but were still practicing uh, doctors and, and were still seeing patients. Um, so how did they get this story at the, at the AJC, at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution? So the, the story kind of started with a reporter who had uh, read through dozens of these um, board documents, medical board documents, um, uh, in the state of Georgia. And they had found uh, about 70 doctors in Georgia that, that um, kind of uh, matched this pattern. They had been sanctioned for sexual misconduct, but were still practicing. Um, and so obviously they, they thought, well, this is a really important story, but how big is this story? Is this a national story? What's the scope and scale of this story? And so they realized, well, Maybe we can use machine learning to get at this bigger question, you know, this, this uh, scope and this scale question. Um, and so they went out and they collected all of the board documents from all 50 states, uh, over 100,000 documents. They scraped those. Um, and then the task became trying to identify within, you know, what's the subset of those board documents that is going to lead us to finding whether or not there are uh, other doctors out there who. Uh, fit this um, criteria for the story. So they turned to uh, supervised machine learning technique, right? They, they uh, read through hundreds of documents and tagged them. Uh, are these interesting or uninteresting uh, according to this pattern that we think is, is an interesting story? Uh, and they trained a very simple classifier. In fact, just a, re a logistic regression model. 
Then, as I mentioned, they went out, they scraped uh, 100,000 documents uh, from uh, all 50 states. Uh, each of the medical board uh, websites was scraped um, and uh, put those into the classifier. Uh, and, of course, there were tens of thousands that the classifier marked as uninteresting, um, but there were also 6,000 that were marked as interesting. Um, so from 100,000 to 6,000, well, that's 6,000, still a lot of documents, but um, but uh, a reasonable number of documents for a team of investigative journalists to look through. So those 6,000 became you know, the, the corpus of material that the investigative team then read through to find the 24, uh, the 2,400 doctors uh, that actually fit this criteria. So of course, there were still false positives that the machine learning uh, classifier um, gave to people, uh, and, uh, but they were, the journalists were comfortable with that given that they knew they were going to read through these documents uh, before they actually wrote up um, the story. Um, here's another system. Um, it's called uh, this tool called Newsworthy. You can check it out online, newsworthy.se, uh, if you want to play with it. Um, this system identifies newsworthy leads um, in periodically updated um, open data sets published by Eurostat in the EU. The idea is that it can detect um, trends and outliers and anomalies in these data sets uh, that may be of interest to journalists. Uh, and then it formats uh, these, uh, these leads and, and sends them to journalists. So you can see you've got a little graph there. Uh, it's plotting the data over time. Uh, it uses text generation to write a few sentences to describe what might be interesting in that lead. Uh, and then you also have links at the bottom to, uh, to download the, uh, the chart or um, uh, a very important feature to get the original data uh, so that you can dig in and see uh, um, the, the raw information there. So that's what the leads look like that get sent to journalists. And journalists can subscribe to these leads by choosing which data sets they want to get leads um, sent to them about, which ones they want to monitor. So, you know, the, these systems and approaches, they, they raise, I think, some really interesting questions about how computational approaches embed evaluative criteria in journalism like newsworthiness uh, and how, um, uh, how that comes to then shape journalistic attention. So, you know, what's selected to become news um, is contingent on a range of individual, organizational, social, cultural, technical forces. Um, you know, does the, does the lead fit with the editorial focus of the organization? Uh, does it fit with audience expectations and so on? Um, you know, different criteria are, in, are important for different journalists and different combinations and at different times. Um, newsworthiness isn't necessarily intrinsic to an event, uh, but it certainly might be story specific, as you saw with the AJC um, story. That was a very specific pattern uh, that they were looking for. I think there's an interesting implication here in terms of how these types of approaches and, and tools get designed, which is that, you know, um, when you have such a, a wide variety of criteria that might apply in different cases and contextual factors, the question becomes how do you configure these systems um, so they can be adapted to suit a wide variety of journalistic scenarios? Supporting more configurability um, uh, in the application of newsworthiness criteria would then demand, uh, I think, the development of comp different computational operationalizations and, and implementations of newsworthiness criteria. Um, and I think this is a really key issue for data scientists who want to do work in journalism. You know, just because you can define a metric uh, because you have the data or you can implement it in code, um, you know, it's, maybe it's easy to implement, that doesn't necessarily mean that the metric is the one that's interesting uh, to a journalist. Um, you know, which, which news values, you know, there, there's a whole array of news values that have been enumerated in journalism studies uh, research things like proximity, novelty, salience, and so on. But which of these news values should we build into computational news discovery um, systems? Um, you know, what makes sense? So I think there's a sort of an interesting area of future work there to sort of systematically think through which news values to translate into algorithms um, and how to do that. Let me give you an example of why I think the operationalization of newsworthiness um, could matter and, and really be kind of important. So this is a screenshot from a tool called Claim Buster. It's a project that was developed at the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, and what this tool does is uh, you can actually try this out online. You can paste in some text 
Uh, it will parse out the sentences from your text, and then it will grade every sentence on a scale from zero to one, uh, with zero being le uh, less checkworthy and one being more checkworthy. And it's essentially scoring each sentence uh, in terms of um, uh, both whether or not it is fact checkable as well as whether or not a journalist might rate this uh, an interesting claim to fact check. Um, and so you're seeing here with an example of text um, uh, drawn from one of the presidential debates from 2016. Um, this tool is actually used uh, in another project at Duke, the Tech and Check Cooperative um, uses Claim Buster to actually grade CNN transcripts every day. Uh, so it scrapes the CNN transcripts, runs them through Claim Buster, grades all of the sentences, and then sends the top 15 of those claims out to a variety of fact-checking organizations like PolitiFact and factcheck.org. So there are actually journalists using these scores to uh, orient their attention. You know, where, what should I fact-check? What's more interesting or um, at least fact-checkable for me to look at? So again, you know, why does this matter? I think you know, by orienting attention and reducing costs of finding certain types of events or stories, these types of data mining algorithms may then come to influence how journalists end up covering various topics or, or beats or claims, um, in turn shaping the news uh, that is ultimately available for public consumption. So the Claim Buster system actually, um, I think, offers a, pr a pretty good example of this, of, of how data mining could impact and shape coverage, uh, because they did an evaluation of the, of the types of claims that the system picks up. They actually compared uh, the, the topic of, of claims that were detected by Claim Buster um, against the topic of claims um, detected manually at CNN and manually at PolitiFact, another fact-checking organization. So just looking at sort of comparing these, you can see the findings showed that Claim Buster identified more claims about the economy and fewer claims about social issues. Um, and so if reporters were to rely on Claim Buster to identify and guide their attention on what what is fact-checkable uh, uh, fact and checkworthy, um, this could decrease the attention that those fact-checkers give to social issues, and uh, that may not be the outcome that we want from this. Uh, another claim buster evaluation uh, looked at 21 transcripts uh, of US presidential debates in 2016 uh, and showed that Donald Trump had fewer, fact, uh, fewer checkworthy factual claims than Clinton did. So. Let's think about that. Um, we also know from their evaluation that uh, the, uh, the checkworthiness score tends to be higher for claims that use things like um, uh, numeric figures. Um, and so this kind of suggests that Trump's rhetoric, his mode of communicating, may have made his statements less susceptible to the algorithm being uh, detecting that they were checkworthy statements. Or simply, he made fewer checkworthy statements, uh, according to the algorithm. So I mean, I think as, as these types of automated systems come to be more adopted um, in practice, an important question is going to be how to assess how they impact the coverage of various types of stories, claims, events, uh, and so on. Um, you know, what's the interaction there with things like political rhetoric? I think journalists are going to need to become more cognizant of the ways that algorithms orient or divert attention uh, in characteristic ways, and then be ready to fill in the gaps um, uh, as needed. Two of the fact checkers that I've interviewed who use um, tools like this one, uh, tools like um, Claim Buster, expressed awareness and concern over the bias in the leads that these systems were sending to them. As a result, they have additional uh, monitoring strategies to track coverage um, uh, and ensure that the balance of claims that they checked is um, adhering to their editorial goals. I think this also suggests a pretty interesting opportunity for future systems to be explicitly designed to empower editors to track the shape of the leads uh, that these systems produce, uh, in including the impacts of how reporters may have configured the systems uh, in particular ways. So maybe future uh, editors might need to think about you know, setting the bounds on an acceptable range of configurations of the software. This is like a new form of editing. Um, so that they encourage a particular shape of coverage um, that these tools lead to. 
So here's one more uh, domain where machine learning and data mining are used in editorial processes, uh, and which I think um, helps illustrate this idea of journalistic values being built into AI technologies. So has, has anyone here ever written an online comment on a news article? Maybe a few of us. Eh, we're shy, I guess. Um, so this is uh, Vladimir Putin's op-ed from 2013. Um, I'm showing it because it was, uh, at the time, it was the most commented article in the New York Times. You can see it got uh, about 4,400 comments. Um, at their best, uh, these types of commenting spaces offer a place for users to exchange information, opinion, debate, uh, interact socially, and so on. Uh, but there's also a lot of potential here for vitriol and toxicity um, that can push people away. Um, in response, news organizations are beginning to use machine learning to help classify and filter toxic comments to make these more inviting spaces. So as of early 2019, um, the Washington Post was receiving somewhere on the order of about 2 million comments per month is the last number I got, um, of which about 70,000 received some form of attention from moderators. In 2017, they launched a tool called ModBot, which is a classifier that they use to help um, help them uh, make those decisions more efficiently. So ModBot can certainly save hours of manual effort reading through comments um, in, uh, um, in making its determination of whether a comment should be moder moderated away. Uh, one of the signals the AI, the AI picks up on is the use of abusive language in the comment. Interestingly though, the system was explicitly designed by the Washington Post to set the abusive language bar higher for public figures with the recognition that a criticism of a public figure should be allowed in uh, a forum dedicated to fostering deliberative conversation on, on societally important issues. So by developing its own system for moderating comments, the Post was better able to match the operational behavior of its AI with professional ethical and normative expectations uh, for um, uh, debate on its site. Question, yes. So was this automatic moderation, or was it tied to some personal thing? Uh, some of it is fully automatic, yeah. It depends on the threshold that they've set, and in some cases, the which moderation queue it's in. So they have different categories of queues. Yeah, I mean, they've been collecting comments for, you know, years and years and years, and they have, um, you know, o over the years, they've accumulated a data set of um, annotated comments, like these are the ones that were mo removed and why they were removed and so on. And they use that to train the model. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about um, sort of the second theme uh, from the book I mentioned about hybridization of machine and human effort in terms of um, another sort of area of work, which is automated text production. Um, this is an example of an article that was generated automatically by a piece of software produced by a company called Automated Insights. It was published by the Associated Press. Um, the, the software generates thousands of earnings reports every fiscal quarter um, uh, for the AP. Um, it takes in structured numeric data as well as um, structured knowledge bases about uh, the, the companies, uh, and then that data gets put into templates uh, that, that sort of describe the earnings for the company, uh, and the articles come out looking like that. You can see they're pretty short, pretty um, to the point, uh, straightforward um, articles. Here's another example of the technology from the Washington Post used in their election coverage in 2016. Um, just as a point of comparison, in 2012, the, the WAPO covered 15% of congressional races. In 2016, using the, um, the automation that they implemented, they were able to cover 100% of federal elections, including all House, Senate, and gubernatorial campaigns. So really kind of in increasing the breadth of coverage. Uh, and here's a site I, I really like called Clockspark. Clockspark. Um, I don't know, any Swedes in the room? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. It's a Swedish um, site um, that uses automated content production in concert with a staff of 14 sports reporters uh, that produces content that, that spans the entire um, 
uh, the entire soccer league in Sweden, essentially, all levels of soccer, uh, down to like the local neighborhood level. So uh, the writing, automated writing software takes in structured data about each local game. It automatically writes and publishes a very short, maybe 100 word factual summary of what happened in the game. Um, things like you know who scored the goals and what's the background of the teams and their league standing and so on. Um, the, the automation provides a breadth of coverage, right? So they cover every game, every soccer game in Sweden. Um, uh, so that you know anyone looking for quick kind of, kind of facts about a local match can find that story. But the automation here is also serving a dual purpose. Remember, there are 14 sports reporters that also produce content on this site. Um, so the, these, uh, these short articles also get used as leads that are sent to the reporters. So um, you know they might be alerting these reporters to a particularly interesting outlier match or an anomaly or something like that that would make a really juicy story uh, if you did some additional reporting uh, um, and got some quotes and kind of fleshed it out a bit. So this straight up automation provides breadth. But then you have automation plus professional reporters to go deep on some of the more interesting things. And that mix of content um, they found has been very effective. One more example here, the, the uh, radar project um, is a collaboration with the UK Press Association and a startup in the UK called Herb Media uh, based in London. And with a team of just five data reporters and a couple of editors, uh, they produce an average of about 8,000 local stories per month across the UK. Uh, its stories are run by various local media outlets, like the one you're seeing here on the Express and Star, that subscribe to a wire service that uh, Radar provides. Um, so to produce, produce these localized stories, Radar uses a, a freely available uh, open government data sets that are tabulated by geographic area. So they're taking advantage of government, who has already invested a lot of resources in collecting this data. Um, and each reporter then develops about two stories per week, two templates per week, um, which include you know, fragments of text and, and logical sort of if-then-else rules uh, for how to translate that data into location-specific text that then gets sent out to all of these local papers. Um, the, the core structure of the articles might be somewhat similar uh, across versions, but then it's kind of locally tailored. So the data journalists at Radar, um, they have to kind of figure out various angles, right, and, and storylines for the data. So this is very human driven. There's a, there's a strong human input to this. Um, the reporters even, even make calls. They do reporting. Um, they add background information. They add national con context. Uh, and they write that into the template. And then the automation is kind of used as a production assistant to adapt pieces of the content locally. Um, a single data journalist can produce about 200 regionally specific stories for each of the two templates that they write each week. So that's 400 stories per journalist per week. Um, so I think the takeaway here is that automation is really being used as a lever for human effort. Radar uses this tool called ARIA Studio. Um, kind of screenshot here. Um, I think this is kind of gives you a hint at what um, hybridization of machine and human effort looks like in this context. Um, in reality, it's really just a more complex word processor uh, that lets the author write fragments of text that are controlled by logical rules. Uh, and there's some, um, there's some functions, some linguistic functions that can be integrated and so on. Um, and so what I think is really interesting here is that some of the advances that we're seeing in automated writing uh, in industry are really coming as a result of what I see as essentially user interface innovations, how to make the interaction between the automation and the human knowledge uh, more efficient and, and effective. So stepping, stepping back a little bit, uh, again, to look at the theme of hybridization, these examples, I think, um, sort of show um, the use of automation uh, working in concert with human effort. Um, Again, as I mentioned before, I think the hybridization of work more often than not, uh, the hybridization of work um, more often than not, um, uh, uh, you know, creates new types of work um, for updating, tweaking, validating, maintaining, overseeing these systems. Um, you know, we're seeing skills and tasks and even jobs evolve in relation to these things. 
you know, uh, a lot of this work will be relatively routine. Some of, you know, things like making sure uh, data streams are updated, you know, when the soccer league changes, um, or, you know, updating knowledge bases about, you know, uh, the corporate, um, you know, where the corporation is headquartered and, and what its structure is and so on. Um, keeping track of new or updated data sets, uh, tweaking or rule sets uh, for templates and so on. Um, other tasks related to supervision and management of automated systems are also increasingly occupying people in the newsroom. As systems are developed, uh, automation editors need to assess the quality of the content so that it's good enough to publish. Um, they need to foresee and, and rectify potential errors in the design process. People have to be available to make and post corrections uh, in the event that these systems make errors, which they do. Um, and people need to be involved in figuring out errors, right, and doing the debugging. You know, why was an error? Why was there an error? And how can we prevent this again in the future? Um, and I think, in general, uh, as newsrooms expand their use of uh, automation, people will need to keep an eye on the big picture to know when to deploy, decommission, or redevelop a system as it adapts over time. I think in general we'll also see newsroom skills um, and even jobs evolve with respect to automated content systems. You know, given the use of template-driven approaches to automated content, uh, writing I think is one of those areas where the craft is, um, is evolving. Um, template writers need to approach a story with an understanding of what the available data could say. Um, basically kind of hallucinating how, hallucinating how the data could give rise to different angles uh, and stories and then delineating the logic that would then drive those variations. Um, so I think there's some, some interesting things there. There's also some interesting implications for labor in terms of de-skilling, upskilling, and reskilling. Um, you know, so uh, de-skilling would be the loss of skills in the workforce. Upskilling would be an increase in skills to meet new demands from these tools. Uh, or reskilling is sort of um, retraining uh, for to, to be able to use these new tools. So for instance, reskilling of the existing journalistic workforce could involve learning new tasks like how to write templates um, and, or maybe doing some light coding uh, or at least familiarity with data and, and logic uh, constructs to act on that data. What my research has shown is that um, you know, new positions are being created uh, at journalistic organizations to do uh, these types of tasks. Um, Reuters has an automation bureau chief. The AP has an automation editor. Uh, Bloomberg has hired um, almost a dozen people to work directly on uh, their automation systems. Um, Radar, as I showed you, um, has created seven new jobs uh, for data journalists to work with this technology. I think these roles are, are pretty interesting new roles. They, they demand editorial thinking as much as they demand um, sort of technical thinking, or at least a capacity to understand what the technology can and can't do um, uh, with respect to the, the state of the art. I think there's probably also going to be some positions at the, at the lower end of the skill spectrum. Uh, I'm thinking more about some of the maintenance activities that are needed for these systems. Um, maybe they're not necessarily low skill, but um, maybe less in need of things like creativity or strategic thinking. Okay, so in the sort of the next final few minutes, I want to talk about um, a bit about the, the future of algorithmic news media and where I think things are going uh, in terms of automation and algorithms and how that will impact um, journalism. So I want to talk about um, four kind of uh, challenges and opportunities I see related to the evolution of algorithmic news media. Um, so the, the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, sorry, the first thing I want to talk about is how technological advances in AI um, uh, um, sort of create, or are, are creating and will continue to create new uh, opportunities in this field. Uh, then I want to talk about kind of some of the HCI challenges of designing uh, hybrid workflows um, between machines and people. I want to talk about how we can develop the human resource, so talking about the human input to these systems and the skills development that's needed. Uh, and then I want to talk about some of the emerging reporting beats um, that uh, journalists sort of need to be responsive to in terms of covering um, and telling the public more about how these systems work. So 
For one, I think journalists and media organizations need to ensure they are tracking technical, technical developments in AI. So here's a Google Home. Uh, really, it's just kind of a stand-in for some of the kinds of advances in voice capabilities that we've seen uh, emerging over the last couple of years. Maybe more interesting than the Google Home, per se, is um, uh, its development of, of duplex technology, which you may have um, heard of last year. It's a voice technology that can, um, that can sort of have uh, voice interactions with people in a very natural uh, way. Um, for instance, the demo that they showed, and I'm not going to play this now, uh, but the demo they showed uh, allows someone to book a restaurant uh, reservation uh, over the phone uh, by talking to a bot that um, knows you know, what, the, um, uh, what the format of that type of interaction and how it should react and so on should be. So what kind of, you know, what could this kind of technology do for journalists? Um, I think there could actually be some interesting potential here uh, for automation to help journalists with one of the most expensive tasks related to journalism, which is data collection or information collection. Um, I'm not suggesting that you know, duplex technology or voice technology could replace reporters, but I think it could enable new types and new scales of data-driven reporting. Um, certainly AI, you know, this type of AI will need to be a lot more advanced uh, to compete with reporters. Um, you know, things like identifying who, uh, you know, what sources to talk to and what questions would be meaningful and interesting to ask those people, and then be able to parse those responses. Um, in a way that um, allows the AI to collect information in a structured way. In general, I think this is, again, just, a, just an example of how I think journalists and news organizations need to be in touch with um, these technological advances and be engaged with scientific communities like um, knowledge discovery and data mining, machine learning, human-computer interaction, and computational journalism uh, so that they're kind of up to speed on what these technologies can offer. Um, the second thing I want to talk, talk about is, you know, kind of some of the HCI challenges that come up with respect to designing hybrid workflows. Um, so I think as people come to interact uh, and become entwined in computational news production, there are a lot of really interesting HCI challenges. The workflows and processes that define how information work is decomposed, delegated to algorithm, and recomposed will, mean, will need to be designed and evaluated. Uh, in, in, uh, um, so that not only so that they're efficient, uh, but also so that editors uh, feel confident in using uh, these, these, uh, the outputs of these systems. So I think, um, I think scholarship and practice sort of needs to jump in uh, and, and undertake an agenda of human-centered AI in journalism. Um, you know, we need to understand the roles and tasks of journalists in hybrid workflows. We need to study the ways in which journalists and AI can effectively interact and collaborate. Uh, we need to elaborate the human perspective and concerns for things like autonomy, agency, and the ergonomics of labor to ensure that these systems aren't intensifying uh, the newsroom in, a, in, a, in, a, in an unnecessary way. Um, I think there's a ton of research to do uh, to study the new and changing news work um, that AI creates when it's blended into journalism practice. Um, I think a key uh, to that design process is going to be understanding how to transfer domain knowledge from journalism uh, into AI technology. Um, how to ensure that that knowledge is reflected in the, in the algorithms of, of news production. So how, how do we go about tapping into that knowledge? I mean, I think there's a few different ways I've outlined here. You can have working journalists uh, um, embedded in newsrooms, experimenting in newsrooms. That entails those journalists needing to know how to code so, they, so that they can uh, experiment with uh, new algorithmic workflows in the course of their, their actual work. Um, you could think about embedding computationalists within newsrooms. So taking people who have a very strong computing algorithm and putting them uh, in the middle of, um, uh, of a, of a uh, of a newsroom environment, exposing them to the knowledge and expertise in that newsroom in a way that hopefully allows them to see opportunities to apply their computational expertise. And then finally, you can think about embedding journalists into computing hubs, so sort of going the other way around, taking the journalist expertise, uh, dropping it in the middle of uh, a computational environment, and letting the osmosis happen that way. 
the next thing I want to talk about uh, is sort of, you know, the evolution of the human input to this hybridization. So thinking about the skills uh, uh, of, the, um, of the people, of the journalists who were interacting in these systems. Uh, and, I, and I sort of tend to think of three different areas where uh, we need to, as educators, advance the skills of journalists in working with these tools. So um, the first is computational thinking, so thinking about how to formulate uh, problems in a way that they can be addressed computationally. It's not necessarily about being able to code, but it's about knowing enough about the capabilities of computing so that you can think about a solution in terms of a programmatic solution. Um, I then, you know, I also uh, think about um, uh, or talk about data thinking. So it's a little bit different than computational thinking in the sense that it's it's more about, you know, how do we collect the data that we're then putting into this system, or how are we sampling or cleaning or uh, validating or critiquing the data that we're piping into these systems. Uh, and then finally is kind of the idea of advanced methods training. So, um, you know, some of these techniques do require uh, more sophisticated approaches, um, thinking about, um, you know, how inferences are made, how to interpret uh, models, coping with the uncertainty produced in uh, some of these types of techniques. Um, and, uh, and so really kind of, you know, having a, a higher level of um, uh, statistical training. So how should journalists go about um, developing these sort of algorithmic media literacy um, uh, um, or these algorithmic media literacies? Uh, what kind of educational offerings are needed here? Um, in my opinion, I think there's probably still a lack of qualified instructors for computational thinking, data thinking, and advanced statistical training. Um, and I'm not just talking about in academia, I'm also talking about in newsrooms, um, you know, the, the way uh, um, uh, journalists are trained in newsrooms, I don't know that there are as yet um, enough sort of advanced statistical thinkers who are able to um, act as, um, as guides uh, in training uh, more junior journalists in that environment. So maybe we need to think about different educational models to kind of up these different literacies for journalists. Um, we might imagine a doctorate of professional practice in computational journalism. I mean, there are some master's degrees programs that are emerging uh, to uh, combine computer science and journalism. We could take it a step further and look at fields like psychology or physical therapy that have um, uh, professional doctorates uh, and um, see whether or not that model makes sense in journalism. Um, we could also imagine a PhD in, in computational journalism uh, that would sort of have an emphasis on how to practically yet generalizably uh, apply computational thinking, data thinking, and advanced statistical methods to issues in journalism. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, you know, with these more advanced um, educational programs, maybe we can start creating a pipeline of people both in academia and in industry who can start teaching these skills to future generations of journalists. The final thing I want to talk about is sort of the emerging beats that are uh, arising uh, as a result of um, advances in, in algorithms, automation, and AI in society broadly. Uh, so I sort of alluded to this earlier, this idea of algorithmic accountability, um, that algorithms are being used throughout society to make and inform a variety of decisions and that journalists should be involved in investigating the power uh, exercised through algorithms in society. Automation is also being used on um, social media platforms, bots, um, uh, uh, and automated media dissemination uh, is creating, are creating new challenges for things like the spread of fake news. I think this also creates an opportunity for journalists to almost think about this as a, as a new um, sphere of activity where you sort of, you know, your whole beat is in monitoring the information flows on online platforms and trying to understand where is the fake news popping up? You know, where is there a botnet that's trying to manipulate the framing of this idea? Um, you could certainly imagine um, uh, a beat on this, um, uh, uh, on this topic emerging. And then finally, um, you know, you may have heard uh, this, uh, new area of um, uh, deep fake synthesized, uh, uh, synthesized media um, being used to generate uh, media that um, 
you know, it hasn't actually been captured from the world, but has been sort of imagined through statistical models. Um, you might have seen some of these examples of like uh, Trump uh, or Obama saying something that he didn't actually say, and this was generated, the video was generated through a statistical model. Um, and so I think this also creates kind of an interesting new challenge for journalists of, you know, media forensics. How do you authenticate these types of um, these types of media that you might come across online? And what kinds of new tools are journalists going to need in order to do that um, type of um, verification and forensics work? So to summarize, I, I just want to reiterate a couple of my main points from today. Um, the presence of human values uh, and news values in algorithmic media, uh, the hybridization of work processes, uh, and how I see these things evolving in terms of new technology, new workflows, new skills, uh, and new beats emerging. Um, I really want to remind everyone that it does ultimately come back to the people, right? What animates algorithms are the people who design, develop, operate, and manage these systems. Um, I think the future of algorithmic media really does need to be human-centered. But I'm entirely confident that at least some of the people who are inventing and will continue to invent the future of algorithmic media are in this very room. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Yes, I heard you. I saw you first in the back. Um, how do you think about the idea of attribution when the algorithm is the source? So um, this is sort of an active area for, um, for debate in the industry, uh, which is how do you byline an automatically produced article? Uh, and currently, the way the Associated Press handles it is that if it's uh, an article that's been produced and published fully automatically by their template. At the bottom it says the data source and the software that's used, Automated Insights, in producing the article. Uh, but there's no byline to a person who worked on the template. If uh, an individual actually writes through that template, so if a reporter does uh, makes a phone call and adds a quote to that story, which they sometimes do, that byline will change to uh, it will say, it will still give attribution to the data source and to the software, but it will say, uh, I forget the exact wording, but it kind of says something along the lines of, this story was produced in collaboration with uh, software produced by XYZ. So this is kind of the model that's emerging. Bloomberg does a similar thing where if it's completely automated, it just says that it's completely automated, and then if a human has touched it, it will add that it's kind of a collab like a, like a man-machine um, collaboration. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's like a strong ethical um, signal or a strong normative signal on what's expected in terms of byline policies yet. The, these things, you know, have only been around for a few years. Um, and I'm not sure that the field has really decided yet on, on what the expectation is there for bylining. <coughs> oh, I think you were next, yeah. My question, my question is how it could be human-centered. Uh, Dr. Yuval uh, Noah Harari says in his book, uh, we being ahead of algorithms, is the window is really short and closing. And uh, algorithms will take over. And as they take over, we'll move from being exploited to being irrelevant. So how would uh, this human-centered issue be, come in play? Because they will practically rule us. Uh, sorry, who was that quote from? Uh, you all know Harari in his book uh, on, on not the Sapien, but the 21st, 21 lessons of 21st century. Okay, so I, I guess my response to that would be that in this domain in journalism, I, I don't think AI is as close to um, taking over jobs or tasks or roles in maybe some other domains. Uh, the type of work involved in journalism is uh, highly creative, it's, a lot of it is non-routine. Uh, there's a lot of complex communication, so when you have to call someone up and ask them a bunch of hard questions and that person doesn't want to tell you the truth, um, even, or even just getting access to that person to get them to talk to you, those are really difficult um, questions. AI is not gonna be able to do that anytime soon. So the, um, 
you know, the, the economics models that I cited, you know, they, they have modeled out the tasks involved in a typical day of a typical reporter or a typical day of a typical editor. And maybe 15% of a reporter's day could be automated. Um, and over time, sure, the technology will get better. Maybe we'll, um, you know, that will sort of um, increase over time. Um, but I just have a hard time believing that people aren't going to be around in this field. Um, even so sorry, I think I misunderstood your comment on human-centered. Yeah. And I think Dr. N uh, Harari's uh, perspective was on the receiving end, the audience, not the technology of writing and reporting and, and, and journalism and all that. So maybe a bit disconnect over here. Uh, I, and I may, maybe I misunderstood the question. When, when I say human-centered means uh, I, I took it from the receiving and the audience and, and the people and the, and the public. So from public's perspective, he meant that it'll be we will be run over. We would not have an opinion of our own. It we, we will be run by algorithms. So I think I misunderstood maybe your question, your statement. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what I mean by human centered is more in in the production yeah, process I of. That. of I stand yeah. corrected. Yeah. So, yikes! Are we going to be run by algorithms? Mm. I don't think so. We already do. Personally. Well, Facebook put, uh, put the president in White House. We can argue about that. <laughs> yeah. Was there another question? Yeah. I thought your example of um, it was radar uh, mm -hmm. producing these template stories that could then basically be elaborated and de deployed in all of these local contexts was really interesting. Generally, I think the sense of centralization of local outlets has been net negative. Uh, you have a lot of layoffs. You have um, less, you maybe less local stories. What do you think the model is for that? Do you think that this is an argument for actually centralizing local news production? Would it be more like syndicated, like you'd maybe you know, syndicate these uh, stories from the New York Times or some other outlet? Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I, th I think we're just we're so early in the development of these new models. I mean, radar has only been around, I think, for maybe a little over a year, um, and from what I can tell, um, they do they are syndicated, and some of the local media will take things off off of that wire and just put it on their website. But a lot of other publishers won't just take it and republish it. They want to do additional local reporting around that um, that story stub. They, they essentially treat it as a lead. Oh, there's something interesting that happened in my community. All right, I'm going to go make a few phone calls. I'm going to go get a photo. I'm going to see if this uh, data-driven story actually makes sense in my local context. So they're, so they're really kind of evaluating it as a lead, doing additional work. Um, so I think that you know they can sort of strengthen I, I, I think what I like about the model is that it, it um, lowers the cost for finding a potentially interesting local angle on something, but it also leaves open the door for local competition, right? I mean, I can take that in a few different directions by doing additional reporting work around that lead. Um, but we'll see how it plays out over the long run um, and whether or not that model really, really pays. I know Radar uh, has actually signed some, uh, some customers, so... It sounds like they're making model, uh, making money, and and they're sort of um, making this model work. Well, it seems like it th this sort of maybe even consultancy approach would work well in perhaps the phase we're in right now, where a lot of smaller outfits won't necessarily have the in-house technical experience. Uh, so then, actually having something centralized that's that's providing that expertise could be the way to go, at least for now. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think um, it's it's a way to 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 centralize the the skills and the and the uh, sort of the algorithmic components. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions from down here? Down here. Oh, what what is the best case study of automating 
the news. So for now, so we, so do you know the best case? The in, best case in news media outlet. So you maybe you, you mentioned, for example, Washington Post more about case. Uh, maybe you know a lot of example mm -hmm. in news media outlet. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think. Um, depending on how you define uh, best. I mean, I think we could define that in different ways. I think the Washington Post is an interesting model. They've managed to increase the breadth of their coverage, for instance, around elections. Um, you know, the AJC, they've managed to increase the comprehensiveness and the scope of their investigation, you know, taking a, a regional story and making it a national story. Um, so, I mean, you know, some of these examples, I think, are best cases, you know, in, in, in different types of best cases. Um, you know, Modbot is an interesting case. You know, they have um, been able to save some some effort and, and make their uh, moderation more efficient. Um, so, um, but I mean, there are still challenges there. You know, even the at, at the Washington Post, um, I, you know, I think, sure, it's great. They can automatically cover all of the federal elections, uh, you know, at the, at the uh, congressional level. Um, but, you know, they can afford to do that as kind of a marquee project. Like, look at us, we automate all this stuff. But is it really worth it to them to invest all of the data science time and effort in producing that in relation to the amount of traffic that it generates? I'm not sure. So I, I'm not sure that, that they're not still doing those types of projects just kind of, it's a stretch to say, but almost maybe as marketing or branding, like look at us, we're, we're technological. Versus like, is it really adding to the bottom line? But again, I think we're still pretty early in this, in this process, so yeah. Another question here? So you introduced Clash Spark, if I'm right. Yeah, so I was interested how the, um, I mean, is their model of automating uh, soccer news reporting similar to how Automated Insights reports, um, like financial earnings reports, like you basically take in the entire statistics of the game and then generate a report from it. Is it something similar or is it something more creative? Yeah, no, it's it's that. It's uh, it's using the data from the games in order to in order to produce those stories. What I think is kind of interesting about the Clack Spark model is that so um, you know local local papers would used to have to call up the local soccer league and and essentially get the data over the phone, um, but. The way ClockSpark works is, is it, it uses another um, uh, company's tool, uh, company is called United Robots. Um, and what United Robots does is it actually centralizes the data collection. So they hire people to call up and collect the data for all the games, and then they centralize that, and they're then able to kind of sell the text production around that data that's being produced. Um, so it is, you know, the, I guess the, um, the, the effort then gets transferred to this other organization that's doing all the data collection work. Another, can we take another question? I wanted to ask if you had any comments on the future of journalism with the consolidation of media outlets and what would be the possible negative consequences of, of AI either being the data ignored or manipulated yeah, um, the future of journalism. What a what a great question to end on. Um, I think uh, I think we can imagine a variety of futures for journalism based on AI and algorithms. Um, you know, one is uh, a commodification of of news. You know, where um, data is cheap and it's everywhere, and there's just sort of these low quality data driven stories flying around everywhere. Um, and maybe an ad model would, uh, you know, ad supported media might find that attractive. Um, I'm more drawn to the future of AI that is more aligned with the subscription uh, models that a lot of news media are now starting to pursue. So thinking about how do we make our news organization jump higher? How do we make more unique, more 
uh, original valuable content. And I think deploying AI in that way, you can think about how do we make our investigations scale up or more comprehensive or you know, larger in scope, um, you know, higher quality in general. Uh, and then figuring out how, how that then ties into the uniqueness, the originality, and the ability of uh, high-end news organizations to then attract subscribers and, and produce revenue that way. Um, so you can, you can sort of see, I think, different, different futures. And then, of course, there's potentially the future uh, in which um, all, of, all of media becomes highly personalized. Uh, and what does that really look like? I, I don't really have a, a clear vision of what that could, like, uh, could look like. Uh, but, you know, I think it's a possible future that, that we should um, potentially prepare for is, um, you know, when every person can see a different version of the article, what does that mean for things like public discourse and our ability to have a shared conversation around something? Um, but I think we're at least a few years away from um, even, uh, from, from news organizations even kind of dipping their toe in the water for that one. Most news organizations are, that I've talked to are sort of uninterested in pers personalization at this time. So. Well, thank you again. Oh, thank you very much.